I'm gonna speak about our home. We all have a home and we, for some people, this is the house they're coming from. For some, it's the neighborhood they have grew up in. And for third, it's just a place on the surface of the earth where they have spent their, the most time on. It all sounds okay, right? But how does it sound I'm coming from a place where five billion years ago, stars have died? Just because I mentioned billions, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we all did know the difference between million, billion and trillion. Think of it like this. One million seconds is approximately 12 days. One billion seconds is approximately 31 years. And one trillion seconds, approximately 32,000 years. So whenever you hear billion and trillion, think of a lot. <laughs> okay. So, our home. Which is the one home that we all share? Well, let's, I think we all know it, and that's our planet Earth. In the words of Carol Sagan, <laughs> yeah, in the words of Carol Sagan, um, everyone you know, everyone you loved, and everyone you've ever heard of has lived out their lives on this planet. Our planet Earth is the only planet that is known to be harboring life the way we know it. Our closest neighbor is the moon. The moon is our souvenir from once earlier times. It is tend to be believed that it created from once huge impact an earlier Earth had to endure. After that, well, our whole star, the sun. The sun gives all the energy or most of the energy on our planet and it holds in its gravitational grip all the planets, comets and asteroids in our solar system. Um, how many people actually know the color of the sun? How many of you think it's yellow? Well, no. One, two, three. Don't be shy, come on. Oh, it's actually white. I'm sorry to break, up, break that for you. Um, after that, Mercury, and I'm sorry for that. And after that, Venus. Venus, where runaway greenhouse effects have turned it into a kind of hell, where the average temperature there it's 462 degrees Celsius, and for the American people here, 863 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty hot there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise you to go there. After that, Earth, and after that, Mars. Mars has as much land as Earth itself, and it's currently inhabited entirely by robots. Yeah. <laughs> Jupiter. Jupiter is the, is the planet of our solar system with the highest mass. And you can basically fit all the planets of our solar system inside it and still have some space left. And this thing over here, this is a storm. It's called the Jupiter Red Spot. And it's basically a storm three and a half times the size of Earth. It's pretty big. Next, <laughs> next is Saturn. Saturn with its rings. Each of those rings represents a little droplet of water that, that is frozen. And each of those droplets of water or a satellite for Saturn. After that, Uranus, Neptune, and beyond that, what, what lies beyond that? Well, basically, a ton of frozen worlds, one of which is Pluto. And, sorry guys, Pluto is not a planet anymore. <laughs> and beyond Pluto, even that far beyond Pluto, we have a man-made object, a man-made object called Voyager 1. Voyager 1 is the satellite that has traveled the furthest from all the other satellites that we have ever launched and it bears a message of who we are and where we are in our solar system. Um, it's traveling approximately with 62,000 kilometers per hour and it's gonna reach our closest star in 78,000 years, which is a lot of time. Any idea how far away is the closest star? Just the mere four light years away from us, just four. So kind of put it, puts it into a perspective. And even that far, we can still feel the gravitational grip of our whole star in a place known as the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is a place where all the comets and asteroids are coming from. And all this is just a part of the Milky Way and a very tiny part. The Milky Way is our home galaxy and we're approximately 30,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And this little red dot over here, if you can see it, guys, this little red dot is not our planet, but it's, it is our radio bubble. Our radio bubble is um, basically all the radio waves that we're transmitting from our planet with the speed of light. And the diameter of this radio bubble, 200 light years in diameter. But compared to our galaxy, it's nothing. Our Milky Way, our, our, our Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda, and a bunch of other small galaxies 
they form the local galactic group. This is our galactic neighborhood. And on this picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, each of those little, every dot that you see over here, it's not a star, it's a galaxy containing billions of stars. And all of this is just but a tiny little part of what is known as the Virgo or Laniakea supercluster. And we're over there. It consists of billions of galaxies. And all of this, all of this is just a part of what is known as the observable universe. And what does observable universe mean, you would ask? Well, it means that basically there hasn't been enough time in the 13.8 billion history of the universe for light behind this point to reach us. Okay, all, all good for now. But you're gonna ask me, why am I telling you this? Why does it all matter? Well, for starters, we all wanna be part of a family, right? We all wanna be accepted, yeah. <laughs> But how are we going to be part of this family if we are so tiny, you would ask? In order to answer that question, we need to go back to the beginning, to the Big Bang, approximately 13.8 billion years ago. But I'm not, not going to speak exactly about the Big Bang, but for what follow after the Big Bang. Back then, everything you know, all the matter, energy, space, was comprised in one trillionth of the size of a point of a pin. This point of a pin was so compressed that all the, four, that the four forces of nature, which are not water, air, land, and you know, but I'm talking about gravity, strong nuclear force, electromagnetism, and weak nuclear force was, were all comprised into, into one force. There were no four forces of nature. For, for reasons unknown, this point of the pin began expanding, and back then, our universe was 10 to the 30th Kelvin's hot and 10 to the minus 43 seconds old. Just for comparison, the temperature of the core of our sun is 15 million Kelvin, which is basically nothing. <laughs> the reason scientists are not sure how the universe began and of the Big Bang is because the general theory of relativity, which is the modern theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics, which is the way matter acts at a small scale, were indistinguishable from one another. And nowadays, scientists just cannot make them work together. As the expansion began, the universe also began cooling down. This meant that the four forces of nature started separating. They separated into gravity, strong nuclear force, and electroweak force, which led to the massive release of stored energy, which led to even faster expansion and faster cooling down. The universe was still being hot enough for photons to spontaneously convert their energy into matter and antimatter particles, which immediately after annihilated into pure energy. Um, for reasons unknown, a kind of asymmetry were bo was born. An asymmetry where for every one billion particles of antimatter, a billion and one particles of matter occurred. This asymmetry was small, but very, very significant for the future of the universe. As the universe continued on expanding, the four forces of nature had finally separated, the electroweak force had finally separated into electromagnetism and weak nuclear force. And for the first time, we had the four forces of nature. The universe, as this trend of the universe continued on expanding and cooling down, the universe was already cool enough and photons could no longer convert their energy into matter-antimatter particles. So all the remaining particles of antimatter annihilated with each other and for the first time, the universe was left with one particle of matter for every one billion photons and no antimatter left. If this little asymmetry hadn't occurred, nothing would have, would have existed in the vastness of the universe except light and nothing else. Not even me here wasting your time. Um, I would like to appreciate that only one second has passed since the beginning of the universe. Yeah. Okay, so after a roughly three minute, per three minute period of time after the beginning, matter started gravitating into each other, and these uh, protons and neutrons they, and electrons, they got slow enough so that they could create the first three lightest elements, lithium, helium, and hydrogen. And for the first time, the universe was transparent to visible light, light that we can still see today as the cosmic microwave background. After a few billion years, as the universe continued on expanding and cooling down, matter started gravitating into each other, creating those huge, huge constellations we know as galaxies today. A few billion of them were created. And in those galaxies, some stars were created. And those stars that managed to reach the mass 10 times that of the sun or higher, we know them as red giants. And in, a star, in those stars, um, in their course, they managed to reach temperatures high enough so, they, so that they could create elements much heavier than the first three, elements that can be found on Earth here. 
But if these elements were to be held in the in their, in stars of their cores, they would have been embarrassingly useless. However, those red giants, they die. Oh boy, they die. They die in supernovas. Supernovas spreading their guts all over space, enriching the universe. After a few billion years of such enrichment, well, a new chapter began. A dust cloud started spinning because of a nearby supernova. And a, a star was born. And in the dust cloud, in the, in the dust cloud around the star, a few planets were born. One of those planets, in a region around its host star, where it wasn't far enough so that water wouldn't freeze, and it wasn't close enough so that water wouldn't vaporize, and Earth was born. And on, the, on Earth, water remained liquid, and in the liquid water, well, life was born by a mechanism unknown. So yes, as far as we know, the universe had a beginning. And yes, it continues evolving. And probably the most mind-blowing fact is that each of the atoms in our bodies that comprises our bodies can be traced to the Big Bang and to those high-mass stars. Some people, when I look up in the night sky, some people tell me they feel small. And, but I tell them, don't feel small, because each of those stars that you see up in the night sky, they gave up their life so that we can exist. Thank you. Well, <laughs> because of special theory of relativity of Albert Einstein, we know that um, the speed of light, the way we see, have a finite speed, which means that everything you see is in the past, which is a little sad. But think of it like that. Whenever you look up in the night sky, you actually look up in, look in the past. And for example, when you look in the moon, you see one second in the past. When you look up in the sun, which I don't advise you to, you look approximately eight minutes in the past. So, yeah, basically, space is a time machine. Wow. Um, okay, so my question is a little less intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, do you believe in life outside of Earth? Like, do you believe in aliens? Of course I believe in aliens. I mean, come on, how can you not believe when there are so many stars and planets around those stars and so many worlds out there? It's like, statistically, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.